September 21st, 2011. It wasn't a good day. It was September 21st, 2011. Uh, we were gearing up for a mission, uh, myself and uh, Staff Sergeant Whipple, who was my junior JTAC on, on the, the operation. He was originally not supposed to go on the mission. He was supposed to bring an airman with me, but they needed somebody for the Overwatch team, and since one of our officers didn't want to have him have a junior airman with him, uh, during the mission, didn't feel it was needed. I decided that I would do the overwatch for him. So I was on one of the overwatch missions with one company. He was going into the valley to uh, secure the town with another company. Well, we landed uh, early in the morning, had to be 2.30, 3 o'clock. We landed on the OP overwatch position there uh, with no incident. We took some Chinooks in, we ran out, we had a company of people. Uh, part of the company, uh, we were on a ridge line at about 11,500 feet. Uh, when the sun came up, part of the company moved to a ridge line on the back side of the mountain range to the west of the objective to secure our west flank. We were in the center on the ridge line and another Part of our company moved to the east side to overwatch the operation. Well, turns out where they put us, uh, the terrain mapping didn't quite work out. We couldn't see the, uh, the objective. We couldn't see the valley. We couldn't see the ridge line. We had a uh, ridge right in our way. And we could actually see people on that ridge line. Uh, it looked like a, an emplacement or something like that. We discussed moving into position to, to do overwatch uh, closer. Uh, there was no way that we could get down the mountain and back up the other ridge to the other ridge line in time for the assault. So we stayed in position. Well, about it, it had to be about, about 6 o'clock in the morning. The next chopper lift came in. Staff Sergeant Whipple's company went north of the objective in the valley was north of, in the canyon north of the the objective uh, as soon as they hit the ground they they disembarked the aircraft and all hell broke loose um, he didn't have communications back to the rear i had already set up our satcom system to be able to send up any kind of troops in contact or uh, 1972's request for air. Or, as soon as he got hit, I, I, I automatically did a troops in contact, uh, declared an emergency troops in contact. Next thing I, I know, I'm hearing him come over the radio uh, screaming for air now. They were in a in a canyon and on the cliff sides they had insurgents dug in the cliff sides. They had snipers, stuff like that. The first KIA was an Afghan National Army guy who Whipple was pushing forward and he was shot. He wasn't wearing any plates. Afghans thought it was better to uh, not bring plates because they were heavy. Well, this was supposed to be a three hour mission. We were going to go in and talk to the valley or talk to the town, make sure everything was okay. Intel said there wasn't that much activity up there. Well, they, they were wrong. Um, they started fighting their way south trying to get trying to get to the town. Whipple controlled a few helicopters and, and things like that. All the way down they were shooting AGMs into the cliffside. Well, uh, we had an aircraft came on and we were going to hit the individuals on the ridge line between us and Sergeant Whipple's position. The commander decided not to. He was kind of worried about the town and Sergeant Whipple's company uh, getting hit. Uh, you know, we got to listen to the Army guys uh, on what the commanders want. Well, keep on going down. They're, they're fighting their way. They get, end up getting to the town, and they're totally and utterly pinned down. They can't move anyways. And I've got a predator up there, and I'm watching this, this unfold. The video, they're pushing the video to me. Uh, I'm hearing 
Sergeant Whipple talk to aircraft. He's got two F-16s on station. They have a couple of 500 pounders each. And they're taking heavy fire from a two-story building in the town. Uh, can't they can't see the, the the building, but they're they're pinned down behind a couple of cars and stuff like that. Well, Sergeant Whipple devised a plan, talking to his captain, the the commander of the company, and he devised a plan to take a couple army guys, and they were going to push forward uh, as long as they were being covered to get eyes on onto the building. Well, Sergeant Whipple was moving forward, and he injured his shoulder. That didn't stop him. He got up, he moved on. They got into position, and he was ginning up the uh, F-16s to drop a 500-pound bomb on, on the building to, to get them clear. What Sergeant Whipple didn't know were two Apaches were moving up the valley, and they were trying to contact him. So I got a hold of them, and I was pushing them forward to them. At the same time, the F-16s were kind of reluctant to drop a 500-pound bomb into the into the town. Sergeant Whipple gave the commander's initials, which is standard operating procedure when it's going to be something like that. And the F-16 started to gin up an attack run on there. He had sent the nine line and everything. Uh, at that point, I got on the radio and told the F-16s they were not to drop. Uh, that I had uh, two Apaches come in. They really relayed it down to Staff Sergeant Whipple. Staff Sergeant Whipple was was upset about me jumping into his control and not letting him drop the 500 pounder. Uh, it 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 was if he would have known the Apaches were coming, I'm sure he would have he would have automatically had the Apaches come in. But once the Apaches got there, he did gen them up with a nine line and they used an AGM and they took out the threat. Uh, after Staff Sergeant Whipple destroyed the building, there was a lull in the fighting. We regrouped and uh, everyone got their encampments ready. Uh, there were still some skirmishes going on in, in the valley, but uh, as we were sitting on our OP, a young teenage uh, Afghan uh, sheep herder came up on our position and it, it was very quick. The ANA grabbed him, brought him in. We were afraid that maybe he was in, like gathering intelligence we were thinking about letting him go well he made a run for it um, at that point as he was running away uh, one of the ANAs brought up their heavy machine gun uh, and uh, at that point one of our NCOs jumped in front of the ANA to stop them from shooting uh, this young kid it was not something you do you don't shoot somebody who's unarmed running away but as the night started to fall, we figured the kid just went back home. So we, we hunkered down for the night. Uh, we had realized that we didn't have any cold weather gear. The cold weather gear that was supposed to be brought to us was left behind. So we're up on a mountaintop at 11,500 feet. And, and I'm going to say, and every time I tell this story, it, it gets colder and colder. So I'm going to say it was like 20 degrees on the mountain. It was more like, it was probably more like in the 50s. But, you know, in the middle of the night, you don't have any cold weather gear and you're freezing. All, what you're doing is you're sleeping in what are called body bags. And that's what everyone did. We put those down on the ground. We were sleeping in body bags that they were dropping from helicopters to supply us during the day with food and water. They'd put, they call them speed balls. They'd put our meals and our water in a, in a in a body bag and drop it out of a helicopter as they flew over and then we'd have to go retrieve it. So that night we hunkered down about 11 o'clock, me and my joint forward observer who was sharing the foxhole with me. And uh, about 2.30 in the morning, all hell broke loose. It was like nothing I'd ever been in. I, I wake up and all I see are tracers going every which way. And the Taliban, they don't use tracers. So it was our ANA shooting across the camp because we were being attacked by three sides. From our north, our south, and our west. Uh, the town was to the east. So uh, I, I attempted to get up and grab my, my radio, which was at my feet. And just rounds were everywhere. 
an RPG hit right next to our, our, our foxhole. Uh, still don't know if it was an a and RPG or one of the Insurgents RPG. There was, there was a, a quick lull in the fighting when people are screaming to cease fire, cease fire, so we could figure out what was going on. And I took that opportunity to, to lunge for my radio. At that point, it opened back up again, and that's when a tracer round just flew inches from my face. Uh, it hit the uh, rock wall. We were in these old goat pens. And it hit the rock wall right next to me, and something just popped me in the face, and I didn't know what it was. I thought I'd been shot in the face. I grabbed my face. I fell back down on top of the radio, trying to get the radio to work, and I hear laughing right next to me. And I look over at my JFO. I said, what are you laughing about? I said, I think I've been shot. And he looks up at me. He goes, he goes, no, that was a rock. I saw it hit your face, and I pulled my hand away from my hand, my face, and he was right. And no blood or nothing. And he was just laughing. It, it's strange how people react in situations like that, uh, because I started laughing too after that. Uh, we have rounds going off everywhere. I get on there. I call the troops in contact, uh, and it feels like an eternity when you're getting shot at. But it, it was only, it had to be only about 10, 15 minutes. At that point, I'm, I'm waiting for the aircraft to get on. Uh, I've got an ISR bird up, that's an intelligence surveillance bird, and they're shooting me down imagery on my rover, which is a TV. Basically, they'll shoot it down to me. It's a TV that I can see the video of what they're seeing on there. So I have them flying around in circles. They're up, they're way up. I, I, I I declare Raws, which is a restricted operating zone, so any aircraft entering the zone will have to contact me to get into the, the operating zone. I had two uh, F-16s, Viper 3-1 and Viper 3-2. They showed up, uh, called in. I ginned up a nine line at that point. I've got uh, insurgents on three sides of me. I've got helicopters, uh, Apaches on station, um, but I'm, I'm really getting ready to drop some 500 pounders uh, on this. And I've got uh, nine insurgents in my video screen, the ISR bird on the west side of us. And they seem to be walking down the hill to get into a better position. It, it's hard to tell what they're carrying through the videos. I mean, you got somebody up at 16,000 feet or more and you're looking at these little gray and white images going around. You don't you, you don't know if it's if it's a hoe or if it's a gun, but you could clearly see at least two of them had what looked to be like RPGs. You can't declare that, so you don't say it. But they were in a, in a position that we believe they were shooting at us and then moving down the hill. I start moving to the west. Uh, it's it's a good. Uh, at least a kilometer from where I'm at and I'm, I've got my rucksack on and I'm running up this hill to get to the west side so I can try to get better eyes on the impacts and stuff like that. I get about halfway and my major's with me, my commander, uh, my JFO's with me. We stop because the aircraft are ready to come in. The aircraft are, are inbound. I'm trying to talk them on to the target. They don't see it. I have the Western OP on my radio. I have them use their their ISLID, which is a, a laser to mark the target. It's not it's an IR laser. Uh, and they, they they start circling the target because they can see the guys. The aircraft number one comes in, he aborts because he can't see the target. It's obscured by by clouds. Number two's in, he pickles off a five hundred pounder. It hits dead center mass of the nine individuals. Number two calls in. I clear him. And all fire ceases as the, sec as the second bomb hits. Um, we sent uh, all everything. They scattered. They're gone. Uh, we decide not to pursue them. Uh, we decide not to send the aircraft after them. 
uh, because we were kind of worried about the guys in the valley. So I passed the aircraft back off to check out the valley, make sure no one's coming up on the east side to flank us since our attention was on the west side. And they go down there and they confirm the bodies are down there. Uh, we leave the bodies there, as our commander says, the Taliban or the insurgents have the right to bury their own dead. Um, we, we stayed on there and there were some more skirmishes. We had some more injuries down in the valley throughout the eight days. Um, and that that's the story of that mission. The lingering effects, uh, it's very traumatic being in a situation like that, being shot at, fearing for your life having to kill people. It's very traumatic. Since since we've gotten back from that battle, and that was in 2011, four of the Army guys that were on the OP and in the valley with us have killed themselves. And I know a few more have had serious issues sleeping. I still hear their voices. It's just something that you got to learn to live with. So when people ask me what the American flag means to me, it, it means a lot to me. It, it's not it's not an object. It's it's a it's an ideology that these guys were willing to go do something somewhere in a far off land to help people they didn't even know. When we got done with that mission, the Afghanis in the town came up and thanked us for not destroying their town. Thanked us for getting rid of the Taliban. It, every mission I've ever gone on, I carried an American flag inside my body armor. So, I guess, I guess that's what the American flag means to me. This story wasn't to say anything about me. This is to give you a glimpse into what veterans go through. 22 veterans a day commit suicide. This is a, a national epidemic in itself. And if you're a veteran, or if you're anybody that's having trouble, please reach out to a suicide prevention hotline. There's nothing in this world that you can't overcome with the support of family and friends. Thank you for watching my video. Stay cool.